Donald Trump was almost assassinated yet again. And who is the media blaming? Well, Donald Trump, but not only Donald Trump, but also his supporters, you. What are they saying and what does this really mean? What does this look like as we enter into the home stretch of this election season? We've got all of the examples of how the left has talked about violence over the years and all of the analysis on today's episode of Relatable. It's brought to you by our friends at Good Ranchers. Go to GoodRanchers.com, use code Allie at checkout. That's GoodRanchers.com, code Allie. Hey guys, welcome to Relatable. Happy Tuesday. Hope everyone is having a wonderful week. Okay, I was just telling producer Bree that I am going to try to bring as much energy as possible to today's episode. But just an FYI, I'm dealing with this headache and I'm very tired this morning. And so I am going to pray for the power of the Holy Spirit to get us through that. But that's just a for your information. And maybe to break up some of the more serious content that we are going to get into today. And yesterday's content was obviously very serious. I'll take a little bit of a break just to tell you about my health journey that is probably leading to this headache right now. Okay, so I'm seeing this functional medicine doctor and I've had a lot of people on my show on Wellness Wednesdays talk about the importance of functional medicine and getting all of this comprehensive blood work done and working with someone who really knows how to look at your entire health map, the entirety of all of your functions and how you can optimize them through various means. And one of them, of course, is changing your diet. Um, I'm about a year postpartum. And just to be candid, this has been the hardest postpartum time for me in losing weight and getting back into like a workout routine and a healthy eating regimen. Maybe it's just because I have more kids than I've ever had before. Maybe it's because of busyness. Maybe it's because of other things I'm not sure. It, and I'm just older. And so it, it seemed that my metabolism was faster. Actually, I think that's uh, not even the correct way to say that if I remember correctly. Whatever it is, I'm older. And so it's more difficult this time. And so as I was talking to my functional medicine doctor and we were going over some of my blood work, I will say, shout out We Heart Nutrition, who is a sponsor today that I'll get to later. Iron levels were good. But some of my other levels were not. And it just seemed like I wasn't absorbing the nutrients that I need to. And I also have hypothyroidism. So she was recommending, you know, as we do some other tests, well, why don't you try to go ahead and cut out gluten and dairy? Now, this is tough because gluten and dairy are two of my main sources of joy in my life. I love gluten and dairy. And I love gluten and dairy together on pizza, in pasta, on fajitas with queso. Like gluten and dairy is a match made in heaven. And I think I mean that literally. Like when we get to heaven, I think there will be a lot of gluten and dairy, but it will be good for us and it won't um, be bad for our health and it won't cause the inflammation that it causes a lot of people today. And I know a lot of you out there are going to say, you should try raw dairy or you should try sourdough bread. I've tried all of those things. It it still just like messes with me. I don't I don't know. It just makes me feel tired. It makes me feel inflamed. So I don't know. I'm going to try this. And I've been trying it for three weeks, y'all. For three weeks, I've been without gluten and dairy. And that has been really tough. I've gone through different like seasons in the past year of trying to do carnivore, trying to do different things. This is the first time I focused on this and the first time I've really been successful. And I will say it's worked in some in in some ways in that like in three weeks seven pounds gone and that is really just because I am realizing just by cutting out gluten and dairy like how much I was mindlessly eating and you moms can probably relate to this but it's like oh I'll just finish the waffles in the morning I'll just finish the peanut butter and jelly at lunch I'll just finish the mac and cheese or the cheese pizza at dinner and that's fine from time to time. But as you're doing that every day, that adds up to like a thousand extra calories that you're not even thinking 
about consuming and you're not even calculating into like how much you're actually eating in that day. And so getting rid of gluten and dairy has made me so much more cognizant of what I'm eating and a lot more thoughtful about it. However, it also is if you've ever done something like Whole30 and actually like hate to promote that program because of the values of some of the people that started it. But I've done that before. And you do go through that like detox period to where you are like your head hurts and you're really tired and your body is like, give me a biscuit. That's all I want. Give me a biscuit and some ice cream. I need sugar and I need carbs. And then you kind of get over it. Well, I did go through that a couple of weeks ago. And now I'm kind of going through it again. Like that's where I'm like, I got plenty of sleep last night, but I'm tired. My head hurts. I'm like, someone give this girl chicken fingers. That's all I need right now. And so I'm hoping that I can get over this soon and start to like really feel better. Part of my problem too, though, is that even though I cut out a lot of just like processed stuff and I'm hopeful maybe one day I can add in some like healthy gluten and dairy one day, maybe, I don't know. Um, But I've eliminated so much processed stuff just by getting rid of that. And I have necessarily added in like, you know, more protein and things because I can just snack less because I have fewer options. But I still have like a very unhealthy eating pattern and that I know I don't eat a good breakfast and that I get too hungry and my blood sugar gets too low. That's something that my functional medicine doctor told me that my blood sugar is actually way too low. And so I think that is probably part of my issue. So hopefully my next stage of healthy eating will actually be adding in a good eating schedule and good food and not just um, cutting out. So I just share that because I know a lot of you are on the same journey. A lot of you are postpartum like me. And I have always said, Oh, after a year postpartum, I'm always down to my pre-pregnancy weight. Well, I'm a year postpartum and I'm not there yet. And so I just want to encourage you, especially if you're breastfeeding like I am, um, that's more important. Every time I tried to cut too many calories, like early on when she was still like feeding a lot, I, my supply went down and I just had to say, you know what? It's not, that's not that important. And I will say for the purpose of breastfeeding, like sourdough bread with some butter on it, it's not good for the weight, but it is really good for like your supply and for feeding. And that was just like my priority. So I finally feel like I'm getting in a time where I can focus on this. And so I don't want any counter advice. I don't want any negative opinions because there's too many contradictory opinions out there and it's overwhelming. But if you have encouragement, if you have some advice for me, also y'all have seen on Instagram that I'm rucking these days, which is, I really like, I just, I love strength training. Actually, that's my favorite kind of working out. And I just really don't have time to like set up a plan and do all of that right now. But rucking kind of kills two birds with one stone because like you've got the weighted backpack on. My husband convinced me to do this. And so that's that's my um, health update right now that hopefully a lot of y'all can relate to. And if you're not there yet, that is okay. And I will warn you that you will lose a good amount of joy by cutting out gluten and dairy. But I, I can't say it's worth it yet. Minus the, minus the weight loss. The weight loss was good. But I cannot yet say you will feel so amazing it's worth it. Maybe in a couple of weeks I'll be able to say that. I'll update y'all then. All right. That's just a little personal update. Now we got to dive into the really unfortunate stuff. The really sad and and dark and disturbing stuff. The stuff that really does matter because people's lives matter. This election really matters. And the truth matters. And so let's get into that. But let me go ahead and pause. I'll tell you about our first sponsor for the day. And that is Carly Jean Los Angeles. I'm wearing CJLA right now. Look how cute this is, y'all. I feel like I have finally kind of mastered transitional fall wear because you know we live in the south we have to wear our fall costumes it I think it's literally going to be 95 degrees this week so I want to look like fall but I don't want to be sweating bullets and so I've got this cute I think it's called called the I don't know golden poppy blouse or or something uh, for Carly G Los Angeles but it's super cute it's really lightweight I absolutely love it and then I've got these cargo pants which I love I want one in every color very flattering very comfortable um, and I love Carly Jean Los Angeles. I love, 
uh, creating capsules by CJLA. You can mix and match a lot of really nice pieces that can adapt to all different kinds of occasions and seasons of the year, different weather, and different times of your life, pregnancy, postpartum. That's what I love about CJLA. They're really quality pieces that you can wear all the time. If you go to CarlyJeanLosAngeles.com and use code AllieB, you'll get 20% off your next order. Go to CarlyJeanLosAngeles.com, code AllieB. All right. We had already, uh, we had actually uh, planned to talk about some other things on today's episode, but obviously with the events that occurred over the weekend, we had to kind of adjust and focus on yet another assassination attempt on President Trump. What happens? What's the truth? There's so many mixed signals and like mixed information out there. And so we're going to try to wade through that and separate fact from fiction on this. Uh, For the second time in two months, there was an attempted assassination of former President Donald Trump. This time as he was golfing at his Florida golf club on Sunday, Uh, Trump was not harmed, thank God, in the incident and the would-be assassin was taken into custody. I'm I'm glad that that would-be assassin is alive because they need to get as much information out of him as possible. Like, how did he know that he was golfing that day? Did he just assume that? Apparently, this man, we're not going to say his name because part of what he wants, I think, is fame. Um, He was camped out there, allegedly, for 12 hours the night before, just staked out with his rifle, ready to literally hunt Trump down like an animal. And of course, he was known by authorities, which we will get to in just a little bit. Trump was moving between holes five and six at the Trump International Golf Club in West Palm Beach with donor Steve Wickoff when gunshots went off. The golf game was a last minute addition to Trump's schedule, sources said. So again, it's strange that this person apparently knew he was going to be there. A Secret Service uh, service agent spotted a rifle barrel sticking out of a fence and agents fired at a man in the bushes along the perimeter, according to Palm Beach County Sheriff Rick Bradshaw. Bradshaw said his office was alerted at one 30 p.m. Eastern time that the Secret Service had fired gunshots. The person was 300 to 500 yards away from Trump, an official said. Now we know there was clearly a dereliction of duty from Secret Service leadership when it came to the last assassination attempt, but I'm very glad that they were there yes, or, uh, Sunday doing their job and doing it well. Bradshaw said no shots were fired by the person who fled In a car, there was a female witness who saw the suspect run from the bushes. And as he was driving away, he took she took a picture of his car that led to the suspect's apprehension. So you go, girl. Good for you for being brave enough and quick thinking enough in a moment of chaos to snap that picture of the license plate. Praise God for his providence there. A police flooded Interstate 95 before stopping the suspect's car and detaining him. The suspect was not armed with law enforcement. Enforcement officials uh, took him out of the car, and he has not made any statements, at least uh, that we know of. The sheriff of Martin County, Florida, recalled that this man was really calm when he was stopped, that it was really off-putting. He said his facial effect was so flat. His demeanor was relaxed. I honestly thought it looked like somebody that had just left the church picnic and was on his way home. I'm not a psychologist, but I would assume that's probably the indication or the indicator that he is some kind of sociopath. Um, This man appeared at a federal court in Florida yesterday morning and has been charged with two counts, including possessing a firearm as a convicted felon and possessing a firearm with an obliterated serial number. The first charge carries up to 15 years of prison time. Additional charges could be brought. Law enforcement officials familiar with the matter told CNN. There's more on this suspect, and it's always wise to wait a little bit to share information about suspects because Russia and China um, and other enemies that we have love to infiltrate American discourse with purposeful disinformation that causes division, that causes disagreements, that stokes resentment and anger and fear. And so we have to do the best that we can to wade through it. And usually if we wait for the noise to die down, 
if people release their desire to be the first, because when you always want to be the first, you are most likely to put out wrong information that can really have an effect. And certainly I'm not perfect in being as patient as I can possibly be, but it's something I have learned over the years that if you wait, not forever, but for, you know, 24 to 48 hours, then you're usually more likely to get the facts right the first time. So people have been debating his politics. There have been arguments about whether he was a Trump supporter or whether he was against Donald Trump. And it's kind of odd because the media won't really say. They'll say, oh, his politics were a mystery. His politics were a mystery? Like he literally tried to murder Donald Trump. I think that we can suppose that he was against Donald Trump, right? Like we can, it's probably safe to assume that. Do we think that the diehard MAGA was going to assassinate the guy that he was hoping would become president? I think it's pretty safe to say that he did not want Trump to become president. I'm not saying that all of his political views make sense. I'm not saying that he was like a diehard lib forever because we don't know that. A lot of his political statements apparently contradict each other and seem just kind of scattered, but he didn't like President Trump. That part of his politics is abundantly obvious by the fact that he tried to kill him. Apparently, this guy, according to his social media, which was archived, it's now scrubbed, uh, he was a big supporter of Ukraine, like really tried to recruit uh, military tried to recruit people, both from America and Afghanistan, to Ukraine to fight in the war. Uh, he does seem to lean left. He does seem to be more of a Democratic supporter. He made 19 small donations totaling to uh, $140 since 2019 to Act Blue, a political action committee that supports Democratic candidates, according to federal campaign finance records. He tweeted at Joe Biden um, uh, not too long ago, just a couple months ago to Kamala Harris, you and Biden should visit the injured people at the hospital from the Trump rally and attend the funeral of the uh, of the murdered fireman. Trump will never do anything for him. He said to Iran or he wrote this about Iran in a self-published book in 2023. You are free to assassinate Trump. This was a book titled Ukraine's Unwinnable War, which described the former president as a fool and a buffoon for both the January 6th, 2021 Capitol riots and the quote unquote tremendous blunder of leaving the Iran nuclear deal. And he also has tweeted to President Biden different pieces of advice for his campaign, telling him that his campaign should be keep America free to try to protect America from the anti-democracy stance, what he would call an anti-democracy stance of Donald Trump. So we don't know exactly where he was politically. There is some indication that he also supported Nikki Haley, that he also supported Vivek. Again, it's just really hard to know what exactly is true here. So I don't want to say that he was exclusively a Democrat, but it's pretty clear that he supported Harris Biden and that he didn't like Donald Trump. So what has been the Democrat response to this? What has been the media's response to this? Has it been to cool it for us to look around and say, okay, like we've got to figure this out because if President Trump or any politician is assassinated, that is going to change the country far more than anything has ever changed the country for the worse. And I don't know with where we are now, morally, religiously, politically, ideologically, culturally, all of it, that we will be able to come back together. I, I think it would take literally a miracle. So uh, let, us, let us look at the response. Has it been that, a moment of self-reflection and peace? Or has it been what you probably expect, something far worse and far more disturbing? Let me pause and tell you about our second sponsor. That's We Heart Nutrition. I'm so thankful for We Heart Nutrition. Like I said, when 
I got some blood work the other day from my functional medicine doctor. She praised my iron levels, which is literally the first time in my life that I have had normal iron levels. I'm always running anemic. I've taken all kinds of iron supplements, and this is the only kind that's helped. And even as I'm working through my health journey, one thing that I'm very thankful for is that I have avoided like cold season. I've even avoided allergies this year, it seems like. And I really attribute that to my supplements from We Heart Nutrition that I started taking at the beginning of the year. It's really been a game changer for me. And I didn't even go through postpartum hair loss or anything. Again, I think it's because of the nutrients that are in We Heart Nutrition and the fact that they come in the most bioavailable form so our body can actually absorb them. They have a 60-day happy heart guarantee. So if you order your supplements and for whatever reason you're not happy with them, you can return them even if the bottle is empty and you will get your money back. Go to weheartnutrition.com, use code Allie for 20% off, weheartnutrition.com, code Allie. So Biden's team, do you remember Joe Biden? Do you remember Joe Biden? Like, who is he? Where is he? What is he up to? We literally do not hear from him anymore, which is kind of scary when you start wondering, like, who is actually running our country? Who has the nuclear codes? Like, who is at the helm if something goes really wrong until the next president is inaugurated? It's not going to be Joe Biden. He, I mean, he's basically an absentee president right now. But someone in Biden's name put out this statement on X. I have been briefed by my team regarding what federal law enforcement is investigating as a possible assassination attempt of former President Trump. I am relieved that the former president is unharmed. Are you, though? Because, as we'll see in just a second, like, I mean, they've been talking about justified violence against Trump because he is a fascist dictator threat to democracy for a very long time. If that's the case, why wouldn't you want him to be harmed? As other people have pointed out, it's either one or the other. Either he's not really Hitler and you're relieved that he's unharmed or he is basically like Hitler and you're not really relieved that he's unharmed. But it can't be both logically, right? Unless they're playing us, which politicians would never do. As I have said many times, President Biden said, there is no place for political violence or for any violence ever in our country. That's interesting, as we will hear in just a second. That doesn't seem like a sincere sentiment. Here's how the media responded to all of this. Pretty amazing. Here's Politico. Republicans outraged over a possible assassination attempt. Quote, they are going to keep trying to kill Trump. They're quoting a Republican. So again, it's the headline is not about the assassination attempt. It's that people could possibly be angry about it. The Washington Post. Another chance for Trump to frame Democrats as dangerous has emerged. Oh, it's Trump's fault. He's seizing on this opportunity when he again almost lost his life. It's his fault that he is framing Democrats as dangerous. Maybe it's because they've proved that to be true. The intelligencer. Donald Trump is a threat to democracy and saying so is not incitement. Just to be clear. The Cincinnati Inquirer. Trump brings these assassination attempts on himself. Mm, that's even worse than, well, what was she wearing? I mean, these are the people who championed Me Too, who rightly said that there is never any justification for a man assaulting a woman, no matter what she did. I agree with that, by the way. There is never any excuse for sexual harassment, no matter what a woman is wearing or what she did. But in this case, it's Trump's fault that he has been almost murdered in the past two months. Because why? Because he is welcoming explicitly this violence? No, because he has different opinions than Democrats. So just keep in mind, when they're saying that Donald Trump is bringing these assassination attempts upon himself, what they're saying is that because Donald Trump believes the things he does, says the things that he does, 
about, say, immigration. It is justified for someone to try to murder him. Who else agrees with Donald Trump about immigration? All oh, just about tens of millions of Americans. So what they are saying is that an assassination attempt on you would also be justified. You'll remember that really dark and disturbing speech that President Biden gave, uh, gave a couple of years ago when he was standing in front of that blood red wall flanked by the military. I mean, talk about dictator coded. And he said these extreme MAGA Republicans are a threat to democracy, they're radicals, extremists, all of this stuff. And they acted like they were just talking about Donald Trump or just talking about these radical far right people in Congress. But when you say MAGA Republicans, you're talking about the tens of millions of people that voted for Donald Trump and his MAGA platform. So you're saying half of the country is a threat to democracy. They'll say something like this and they'll say just, you know, for PR purposes that they're not talking about you. They're talking about you. Keep that in mind. NBC News, man in custody after Trump golf club incident was once was once convicted of man in custody after Trump golf club incident was once convicted of possessing a machine gun. And yet there he was with another machine gun. Bloomberg, Trump blames Harris rhetoric seizing on assassination attempt. The Atlantic, Trump is no Gerald Ford. No other president has used an assassination attempt to inflame American politics the way Donald Trump does. Again, it's Trump that's doing the inflaming, not the Biden supporter who tried to murder him on a golf course. Here's more of that Atlantic article. After the attack in July, Trump engaged in a self-indulgent ramble at the GOP convention. Actually, that was like one of the best speeches that Donald Trump ever gave when he focused on that, almost losing his life. Is that self-indulgent to talk about the fact that you were almost murdered, that a bullet literally grazed your ear? It's incredible that we have stopped talking about that. But he did not blame Democrats, the author of this article acknowledges. He left that for his surrogates in the party. This time, he's not even bothering with any of that outsourcing and is instead using his latest incident to blame his political opponents, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, for putting him in danger. In other words, Trump is blaming two possible attempts to kill him on pretty much anyone who isn't an open partisan on his side. But that's funny because Democrats are blaming him for being almost murdered for not agreeing with them. At this point, with two apparent plots against him foiled, a more thoughtful person would consider what he could do to help turn down the temperature in the nation. So it's Trump's responsibility to turn down the temperature, even though he is the victim of two almost assassinations. Not the media's job, not the Democrats' job, not the people who are uh, apparently in some ways, in some subsets of the left, inspiring these kinds of people to enact this kind of violence. But Trump himself, Trump himself. Okay, let's see what else the media had to say about this. How did they frame this? Insane, rational, reasonable ways? No, we know too much at this point. Here is Lester Holt from NBC Nightly News, SOT1. Today's apparent assassination attempt comes amid increasingly fierce rhetoric on the campaign trail itself. Mr. Trump, his running mate J.D. Vance, continue to make baseless claims about Haitian immigrants in Ohio. What? Are you kidding me? It is because Donald Trump pointed out residents of Springfield, Ohio, are concerned about the integration of Haitian migrants. That's why he was almost murdered on the golf course again, blaming him for his own would-be murder is insane behavior. That is insane behavior. Look, I I've said this before. I didn't agree with Donald Trump's strategy and bringing up the pets story because even if there is some truth to it and we, we don't really know if there's truth to that part of the story, as I've said many times, it sounded too fantastical. And there are actually bigger and provable problems going on there. Of course, that's what happens when you import tens of thousands of people who have no 
idea what a first world country is like, no idea about the culture. It's really not fair to the immigrants who have been suddenly imported. It's also not fair to, fair to the Springfield residents who have had to deal with increased crime, higher housing prices, and a more difficult time finding a job because they cannot compete against the subsidized Haitian immigrants in their community. And these Haitian immigrants are not being held to the same standard when it comes to the driving rules and regulations, which is why both an 11-year-old boy and a 75-year-old woman have been killed due to the reckless driving of Haitian immigrants in that area. I mean, those are real valid concerns. And these Springfield residents um, are allowed to voice their fear and to voice their worry and to ask their elected officials to protect them. Someone's got to advocate on behalf of American citizens. Unfortunately, many people, I would say almost everyone in the media, but uh, also some Christians believe that loving your neighbor means selling out your fellow citizens for non-citizens. And that's just not true. We can love all of our neighbors, no matter their background and no matter their nationality. That's true. But we also have to ask ourselves, what is right? And what is right is protecting the citizenship and the rights that come with citizenship of our fellow Americans. That is like the sole primary, at least, responsibility of the government. And it is okay for us to put the well being and the rights and the safety and security of our fellow citizens first. We at the very least have to prioritize that and care about that. And Lester Holt is saying because Donald Trump and his campaign have brought that up, totally legitimate argument that he deserves to be murdered. Again, who else believes the same things that Donald Trump is saying about immigration and what's happening in Springfield? Most of the Springfield residents, most of you out there, and Lester Holt is saying, no, oh. like if you say that, if you hold to that belief, don't be surprised if you get murdered. Here's Alex Witt from MSNBC, SOT2. Do you expect to hear anything from the Trump campaign about toning down the rhetoric, toning down the violence, or would that be atypical of uh, the former president? I would love for us to have a unity type moment, but I think it's probably gonna be pretty fleeting as we've seen in the past. Again, is it Donald Trump's responsibility to tone down the rhetoric? I'm not saying that he shouldn't. I mean, maybe in some cases he should. Actually, I would say 100% he should. What he said about Taylor Swift on Sunday morning was absolutely asinine. Like, are you kidding me? Do you want to lose? That was so dumb and so unnecessary. So I'm not saying that I agree with all, all of Donald Trump's rhetoric, but nothing that he says justifies the actions that have been taken against him. Absolutely not. And that, again, is insane behavior and an insane mentality to say something like that. Okay, we'll get into more of this in just a second. Let me pause and tell you about our next sponsor. That's Cozy Earth. Y'all, I love my Cozy Earth sheets. Love them so much. I sleep so well on them. They're temperature regulating. They're the softest sheets that I've ever had. And I also love their towels. Their towels and sheets, it's all I can use now. I, I ignore all of my other towels. I put in storage all of my other sheets because I only ever want to sleep on Cozy Earth. So comfortable, so luxurious feeling. Also, their loungewear is amazing. I have this quarter zip that I just got from Cozy Earth that I wear all the time, even when it's 95 degrees outside. They offer a 100-night sleep trial for their sheets. So if you're not completely in love with their sheet set, after three months, you can return them for a full refund, but I know you're going to love them. Go to CozyEarth.com slash Relatable. Use code Relatable for an exclusive discount of up to 40% off. Go to CozyEarth.com slash Relatable, code Relatable. The callousness of the responses by some people on the left is just so... Disheartening, not surprising at this point. Uh, Rachel Vindman, she's the wife of Alexander Vindman. Like you remember, he testified against Trump in the first uh, impeachment hearing against Trump. She's also host of the Suburban Women Problem podcast. You might be the problem. You might be the problem. 
she said this on X. No ears were harmed. Carry on with your Sunday afternoon. Just so heartless. Bill Crystal, he used to be, I think, considered a conservative. He is the editor at the left wing rag, The Bulwark. And he said, Walls should consider canceling the debate with Vance. Vance would use his time on a national stage to slander minorities, further poison the national discourse, and incite potential violence with lies. Walls could rebut Vance's falsehoods, but why risk the further incitement? Again, just incredible. Like, who is doing the incitement here? Like, where is the violence coming from? I want to know. That's going to be an interesting debate, by the way. That's happening on October 1st, I believe. I think I'm going to help provide coverage for that on Blaze TV. And I would not I would not assume that Tim Walls is not going to do a good job. I think that Vance is extremely articulate. I think he's going to do a great job. Um, but I would not count Walls out, just like I didn't count Kamala out. I knew she was going to be very well prepared Walls is too. Walls is naturally, I know this is an aside, we'll talk more about this, but Walls is naturally more likable than J.D. Vance. I like J.D. Vance, obviously, a hundred times more. I actually find personally J.D. Vance likable, but I can under I can understand um, just kind of, I, I understand. I understand why a lot of suburban women m might feel that he is a little bit too brash and off-putting. And so I would be wary of that if I were the Trump campaign. Um, also, we've got Trump's responses here. He thanked everyone. This is on X. He thanked everyone for their concern and well wishes. He said it was a most interesting day. He thanked Secret Service as well as law enforcement where he where he is. He said, um, as the 45th president of the United States and the Republican nominee in the upcoming presidential election, um, you know, he says that he was safe and the job was done absolutely outstanding. I am very proud to be an American. So that's nice to hear. I would say like that's a unifying statement. And um, he also lays lays blame um, on Democrats. He said the rhetoric lies as exemplified by the false statements made by comrade Kamala Harris during the rigged and highly partisan ABC debate and all of the ridiculous lawsuits specifically designed to inflict damage on Joe's than Kamala's political opponent, me, has taken, sorry, he just makes me giggle the way he, the way he talks sometimes, has taken politics in our country to a whole new level of hatred, abuse, and distrust. I completely agree with that. Because of this communist left rhetoric, the bullets are flying and it will only get worse. I mean, he's right to point out that communism has always unconditionally been a very violent ideology. Um, our borders must be closed and the terrorist criminals and mentally insane immediately removed from American cities and towns deported back to their countries of origin. This is the kind of rhetoric that the media said incites violence and justifies murder. Again, who else believes all of this? Tens of millions of Americans, and they happen to be right, by the way, to believe that. Uh, we want people to come into our country that love our nation and come in legally and through a system of merit. The world is laughing at us as fools. They are stealing our jobs and our wealth. We cannot let them laugh any longer. Make America great again. Like, I think that this is really the heart behind why Trump ran for president um, is to truly ensure that America's jobs and that their wealth um, and that our wealth and that our place in the world is protected. I think he really believes that. Sincerely, I think the driving force behind Kamala Harris's campaign is abortion. So decide what you want. The person who believes in borders and keeping our country safe and secure and prominent and prosperous or the person whose entire career has been dedicated to making it as easy as possible to abort children through all nine months who voted against the born alive survivors protection act who also while she was attorney general while she was district attorney in california made it as easy as possible for criminal legal aliens so illegal aliens who have committed more than just the crime of illegally crossing the border to stay like she is part of the reason why Kate Steinle was murdered in San Francisco in 2015. She has a very murderous history. And so like when you're looking at which side is more violent, like which side encourages chaos more, 
it's absolutely Kamala Harris's side. And so it's just, it's projection, everything that we're seeing from the left. DeSantis, being the governor of Florida where this occurred, made a statement too. He said, the state of Florida will be conducting its own investigation regarding the attempted assassination at Trump International Golf Club. The people deserve the truth about the would-be assassin and how he was able to get within 500 yards of the former president and current GOP nominee. I still love Ron DeSantis. Like, I still think he's doing such a great job as the governor of Florida. Uh, so good job, Ron DeSantis. Um, let's look at how the left has played a role in this. And look, let me say what I'm not saying. I am not saying that criticizing Donald Trump or criticizing anyone is inciting violence. I am not saying even that all comparisons to a dictator or a tyrant are incitements of violence. I am not saying that intense disagreement is an incitement of violence. I am not saying that we have to pretend that we all get along, that uh, we are on morally equal sides, and that we just have these slight divisions when it comes to certain policies. That's just not the truth. That's not how the right operates. That's not how the left operates. Truly, our disagreements between the right and the left are very fundamental. They're largely foundational. They are spiritual. They are profound. Maybe not as deep in every single area on every single policy, but on a lot of in a lot of ways, we are talking about disagreements about human nature and where we come from and like where we get our worth and value from. So we've got some really big differences on the right and the left. And I am not saying that highlighting those differences, defending your position is an incitement to violence. I'm not saying that. But calling for violence, talking about hurting the other side, especially physically, vindictively, like I do think that is an incitement to violence. And yes, when you say things that are not true, as in Donald Trump is Hitler, or he's worse than Hitler, he's exactly like Hitler, he's going to do what Hitler did. When you lie like that, because that's not true, that's based in irrational hate that someone who is already unstable is going to latch onto and then capitalize on to inflict violence. When you spread those kinds of malicious lies, yes, you are encouraging a level of violence. So listen, I'm not talking about disagreement and debate and even intense scrutiny and criticism. I think you're totally allowed to do that. I think that's totally fair game without being accused of inspiring violence. But the level of disgust and irrational hate and encouragement of retribution by many Democrat politicians, I do think has created this culture of violence that we see disproportionately from the left. And I will go through the examples, the most prominent examples of how this has happened over the past few years. But first, let's look at what I'm talking about. These are montages that have been created. Uh, the first by Trump war room of Kamala Harris and the Democrats explicitly calling for violence or joking about violence, which we just don't need uh, over the past few years. Here's SOT 3. If you had to be stuck in an elevator with either President Trump, Mike Pence, or Jeff Sessions, who would it be? Does one of us have to come out alive? <laughs> Press always asks me, don't I wish I were debating him? No, I wish you were in high school, I could take him behind the gym. That's what I wish. I said, no, I said, if we were in high school, I'd take him behind the gym and beat the hell out of him. I, I, I just don't even know why there aren't uprisings all over the country, maybe there will be. That you cannot be civil with a political party that wants to destroy what you stand for, what you care about. That's just unfortunate. And I wish I could say that the context for those clips make it better, but they don't. And the next compilation, the full version is two and a half minutes. We can't play the full two and a half minutes. And so, Here's an excerpt of this. It's sought for. They're still going to have to go out and put a bullet in Donald Trump, and that's a fact. Look as his character is stabbed to death. Where is John Wilkes Booth when you need him? I have thought 
an awful lot about blowing up the White House. A Missouri state senator is under investigation by the Secret Service after saying she hopes President Trump is assassinated. I will go and take Trump out tonight. Okay, so we're not just talking about disagreement there. Like, we're not talking about debate, uh, debates. We're not talking about divisions on policy. We're not talking about intense scrutiny. We're not talking about a thoughtful analysis about the ways, uh, you know, of the ways that Donald Trump reflect some Hitlerian characteristics or behavior. We are talking about explicit calls to violence. The Trump fans campaign released a statement yesterday that offered examples of the Democrats calling for violence over the years or different statements that have that have compared Donald Trump to a horrific fascist that is going to bring this country to ruin, take away everyone's freedoms and rights. Like you could see how an unstable person would hear that over and over again and believe that he is going to become a hero by taking out Hitler 2.0, right? And they know that. They know that at this point and they persist in it. Anyway, Joe Biden said it's time to put Trump in a bullseye. Joe Biden said, I mean this from the bottom of my heart. Trump is a threat to this nation. Joe Biden said there is one existential threat. It's Donald Trump. Joe Biden, Trump is a genuine threat to this nation. He's literally a threat to everything America stands for. Joe Biden, Trump and MAGA Republicans are a threat to the very soul of this country. Remember the the speech that we referenced earlier, Joe Biden, Trump and the MAGA Republicans represent an extremism that threatens the very foundations of our republic. Tim Walls, are Republicans a threat to democracy? Yes. Are they going to put people's lives in danger? Yes. Here's top five. But these guys are just weird. That's really weird. So, and it, it isn't much else. Don't give them the power. Look, are they a threat to democracy? Yes. Are they going to take our rights away? Yes. Are they going to put people's lives in danger? Yes. Are they going to endanger the planet by not dealing with climate change? Yes. They're going to do all that? Yeah. So, I mean, this is the guy who is the governor of a state in which at least eight babies who survived abortions were left to die because of the health care policies and the lack of health care policies in his state. He is an extremist on abortion. He has said so. He's proudly we played the clip of him at a Planned Parenthood rally saying that he is no, uh, more pro-choice than Nancy Pelosi. He claims that Nancy Pelosi told him to tone it down on abortion and he can't. He can't get enough of it. He loves it so much. He is an ardent supporter of the killing of unborn children. And yet he says that Republicans are putting people's lives in danger. Nancy Pelosi said that Donald Trump is a threat to our democracy of the kind that we have not seen. Uh, Representative Jasmine Crockett, MAGA, they are threats to us uh, domestically. Representative Dan Goldman, that Trump has to be eliminated because he's destructive to our democracy. A uh, democracy. Harris surrogate Liz Cheney says Trump presents a fundamental threat to the republic, and we are seeing it on a daily basis. Representative Maxine Waters, are Trump support, uh, supporters preparing a civil war against us? Crazy conspiracy theory there. Um, and you'll also remember that the federal government claims that it's right-wing white supremacists that are the greatest domestic terrorist threat to this country. Not the rioters that we saw destroying cities in 2020, the summer of George Floyd. I mean, not these people who are trying to assassinate Donald Trump, not these people who are calling for explicit violence against Donald Trump, but these organizations of apparent right wing white supremacists that we don't even know about. We don't even know any of their names. We don't even know any of their group names. But they're just out there, and they're apparently the biggest threat. They haven't done anything. They haven't killed anybody, but they're apparently the biggest threat. Scare tactic. Representative Eric Sorensen, he is the greatest threat to law and order that we have in our country. Hmm. Rick Wilson of the Lincoln Project. They're still going to have to go out and put a bullet in Donald Trump. I'm sure it's all metaphorical, right? Right. Uh, well, here's an organization that is doing everything they can to stop violence, and they are stopping violence for the most prominent victims of violence in this country, and that is the unborn 
child who about a million times every year is killed uh, inside the womb. And Preborn is a network of clinics trying to do everything they can to save those babies. They offer free resources to moms in need. They offer free sonograms to moms who come in and need more information about pregnancy, about keeping their baby or about adoption. And when a mom sees that baby on the ultrasound and she hears that beating heart, she is so much more likely to choose life. And Preborn is there for for her to make that life affirming choice, but they need your help. The cost of a free sonogram is $28. If you can go to preborn.com slash Allie, donate that $28. You can help save a life, but donate whatever you can donate $5, donate maybe $5,000, whatever is your best gift. Donate that go to preborn.com slash Allie. All right. The New Republic, you might remember this. They published a series in May, starting in May, called What American Fascism Would Look Like. And the front cover is Donald Trump looking like Adolf Hitler. Um, American Fascism. Donald Trump with the little Hitler stash right there, as you can see if you're watching on YouTube. We've got Claire McCaskill. She is a former Democratic sen senator from Missouri saying that actually Trump is Worse than Hitler and Mussolini. Here's thought six. A lot of people have tried to draw similarities between Mussolini and Hitler and the use of the terminology like vermin and the, the, the drive that those men had towards autocracy and, and dictatorship. The difference, though, I think makes Donald Trump even more dangerous, and that is he has no philosophy he believes in. He is not trying to expand the boundaries of the United States of America. He's not trying to overcome a neighboring country like Putin is in Ukraine. I, I, I don't really understand how that makes Trump more dangerous that he's not trying to do that. I, I know we have this idea that people in Congress are smart, that they're smarter than us. They're not. I pro they're actually not. It's not just that we're seeing these sound bites and we're like, oh, they seem dumb, but I'm sure they're really smart. Like if you're a politician, you're in the halls of power. Surely you got to be kind of smart. I promise you that they're not. I have been a pro-life witness in Congress, House Congressional Committee meeting, and I went back and forth with Democrats. And I thought I was intimidated at first because I was like, I'm going to hear some really good arguments that I haven't heard before. Am I going to have a response to their defense of abortion? I'm telling you, these people are not smart. They're not like they gave me no better arguments than I saw by the, you know, from the random Twitter troll about abortion. I was like, oh my gosh, I am. And I am not saying that I am Elon Musk brilliant by any means. I just know my arguments when it comes to these issues, but especially on the issue of abortion. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is, I don't even feel fair going against you, Debbie Wasserman Schultz, because like your arguments are so dumb. They are so dumb. Like we are not matched well. So understand that you, all of you out there are smarter than these Congress people. So if you ever hear them give an argument and you're like, they surely didn't say something that was that vapid, right? No, they did. They did. That's their best. That's the best argument that they can possibly give. And like giving power to people that are not smart and also have no moral compass is the worst idea ever. That's why we live in this cakeistocracy right now. Let's give some examples of this violence, how it's manifested itself over the years, because it's easy to forget about these examples. I went some through some of them on my Instagram, and I saved this to my election 2024 highlight, so you can go through them. You can share them if you need to. But you'll remember in 2017 when Steve Scalise, the Republican uh, congressman, he was seriously wounded when a gunman opened fire on members of the Republican congressional team. Three others were also wounded. This 66-year-old gunman was a supporter of Bernie Sanders. He called Trump a traitor who has destroyed our democracy. He said it's time to destroy Trump and co. And he was also heard yelling at the time, this is for health care. 
Now you'll remember it was very popular during the 2016 election and even after for Democrats, including Bernie Sanders, to say that Republicans are going to kill tens of millions of people. I think the exact number was like 24 million people or something like that because they are going to destroy health care and they don't support socialized health care like Bernie Sanders did. And so an unstable person hears something like that and they're thinking, oh, my gosh, wow, I'm going to save 24 million people by taking out these Republicans. And again, it would be one thing if that statement were true. It, it wasn't true. It was a lie. That number was a lie. In 2022, Kaylor Ellingson, he was an 18-year-old Republican. He was killed by a man who ran him over. And this man was sentenced to five years in prison after he pled guilty. And the man who ran him over, and I'm really trying to avoid saying their names because, again, I just wonder if these people do this for fame to be seen as some kind of hero and vigilante. I might have said some of these people's names before, but I'm I'm trying to uh, avoid that from, you know, from the past few months onward. And uh, he said that this teen, this 18-year-old who lost his life, who was run over, was a quote-unquote Republican extremist. This happened in North Dakota in 2022. In Michigan in 2022, a former nurse named Joan Jacobson, 84 years old, was canvassing with the Right to Life of West Michigan when a man uh, and his wife told Jacobson they wouldn't vote against Prop 3. Prop 3 uh, enshrined so-called reproductive rights, abortion into the state constitution, allowing it for virtually any reason through nine months. She was going house to house trying to convince people to vote against Prop 3. Uh, when this 84-year-old woman walked away from this discussion, the man shot her in the back. And guess what? He pled no contest to three charges, assault with a dangerous weapon, careless discharge, reckless use of a firearm. He received no jail time. He was sentenced to 12 months probation and 100 hours of community service for shooting an 84-year-old in the back. Wow. Social justice kills. 2022, Supreme Court Justice Brett Kavanaugh. Uh, a man was arrested outside of his home and charged with trying to assassinate the Supreme Court justice. The would-be assassin allegedly traveled from his home in California to Kavanaugh's home in Maryland to kill him. According to an affidavit filed after his arrest, the man said he had been upset by a school shooting in Uvalde, Texas, and believed Kavanaugh would vote to loosen gun regulations. But you will also remember this was right around the time. This was after the Dobbs decision had been leaked. And so it was known that he was one of the justices that was going to vote um, for overturning Roe v. Wade. And this happened amidst a lot of rhetoric, you'll remember, online from Democrat activists actually saying that Clarence Thomas and Kavanaugh and the other conservative justices should be killed, should be made afraid. There were activists and protesters outside of their homes at this time because they voted in accordance with the Constitution on the, jo on the Dobbs decision. In 2023, Mark Crosby was praying at a Planned Parenthood in Baltimore uh, alongside an 84-year-old pro-lifer when um, both of them were brutally attacked and knocked unconscious. Crosby tried to help his friend, but then he was also knocked to the ground. He sustained traumatic injuries to the head, including a fractured bone in his face, blindness in one eye, two fractured fingers, severe bruising. The orbit around his eye had to be replaced with metal because it was completely smashed for praying in front of a Planned Parenthood. Also, you'll remember, just going out of order here, I forgot about in 2017, when Rand Paul was attacked. Now, this apparently, according to the neighbor, was some kind of like domestic dispute um, or not domestic dispute, but just like a neighbor disagreement about the leaves in the yard. But it's really hard to believe considering how prominent of a Republican Rand Paul has been. And he was attacked by his neighbor. He suffered five broken ribs, bruised lungs. Apparently his lungs have never been the same 
um, since then because of this person's political violence. So I, I don't know of mirroring instances on the other side. Do you? Am I am I forgetting? I mean, I know the awful Charlottesville incident where there was a woman who was run over. Are, are there instances of prominent Democrats being assassinated or almost assassinated or attacked in in recent years because if not i don't think it's republicans who need to be chastised for rhetoric i mean and then we didn't even include the recent slew of those who claim to be transgender who have inflicted violence on their communities covenant christian for example when she said explicitly in her manifesto that she was going out to kill Christians and Christian conservatives and transphobes. And allegedly the shooter in Georgia also felt that he was defending the cause of transgenderism. So like, I'm not saying that everyone on the left is violent. I'm not saying everyone on the left wants violence or is promoting violence. There are violent, batty people on both sides. I think that there are kind, considerate people on both sides. But when we look at the instances of violence, it seems to come from the party whose keystone, who's like rallying cry right now, is murder of babies inside the womb. So I can't say that's all that surprising. And like, I can say that that party stands for murdering babies inside the womb because that's literal. That's true. That's not hyperbole. That's literally what abortion is. That is literally a key part of the platform of the Democrat Party and a huge part of Kamala Harris's career. And so, like, that seems really violent to me. I don't really want to see the finger wagging. I want to see some self-reflection. But then you start to get far more worrying thoughts that maybe this is intentional, that maybe this is the effect that they want. I really hope not. I mean, what's going to be the result of that? Can you imagine that that kind of side is going to take Donald Trump winning the election well? I mean, again, like I, we saw January 6th. I saw January 6th. I cried when I saw what was happening on TV on January 6th. I, of course, am against that. But remember, the only person that died that day was an unarmed protester, Ashley Babbitt, who was shot in the chest. And so again, that's not even a, like a good comparison. And even if that was the only counterfactual you had, like it's still very lopsided when we're looking at, at who is inflicting the terrorism and the violence, right? So that is the unfortunate reality of it. And it's uh, something to keep in your tool belt if you, as you are having these conversations with your friends from the other side. My preference is that we would be able to debate and discuss and critique and even criticize without there being any threat of violence anywhere, no matter how much I disagree with someone uh, from the other side. Like, of course, this is not the answer. Of course, I want us to have these peaceful but lively debates. It just seems like we are so far apart. And Lord, I just pray for his mercy. <laughs> I just pray for his grace. I pray for him to help this nation and to change hearts and to change minds. That's the only way this is going to be fixed at all. And may Christians continue to be lights in the darkness. Don't believe that speaking in the truth, that speaking the truth in love is um, is divisive or is wrong or is unloving. It is the most loving thing that we can do. And yes, it will offend. Like remember Stephen, full of grace and truth, who was so kind and shared the gospel with those who needed it. And what was the result? He was stoned to death. So don't measure your obedience by people's reaction to you. Keep on speaking the truth in love. Please, please continue to be a refuge of clarity and courage in this age of chaos and cowardice. We need that more than ever. And remember that you are immortal until God calls you home. He has planned every single one of your days before any of them came to be. And all of this that we're seeing is a fear tactic to tell you that the price is too high to stand up for what you know is good, right, and true, or something even just that is controversial, like voting for President Trump. But don't let that fear control you. Do the next right thing in faith with excellence and for the glory of God, and God has got you.
He's got you. He's got his people. His eternal plan of redemption is always going off without a hitch. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness therein. Remember that. Um, all right. Let me pause and tell you about our last sponsor for the day. That is Crowd Health. If you are tired of the burdens of health insurance, if you are tired of the complications that come along with health insurance, then maybe it's time to opt out of that and to join the crowd for $175 for an individual or $575 for a family of four or more, you will get access to a community of people who are willing to help out in the event of an emergency. You get access to telemedicine visits, discounted prescriptions, so much more without doctors' networks getting in the way. And of course, you join the crowd, a group of members just like you who want to help pay for each other's unexpected medical events, health care insurance. Health insurance is confusing, expensive, and frustrating. It's time to join crowd health to help with your health care needs get started for only $99 a month for your first three months by going to joincrowdhealth.com slash Allie crowd health is not insurance learn more at joincrowdhealth.com slash Allie All right, y'all, just a couple of announcements. Um, all this craziness that we are talking about, the fear, the anxiety that you might feel, I want you to know that you are not alone and that when it comes to what is biblically true, I'm not even talking about more nuanced political disagreements or debates, but when it comes to what is biblically true, when we're talking about life inside the womb, when we're talking about the definition of marriage, when we're talking about the reality of male and female, when we're talking about all these issues that are considered culture war issues, these controversial issues that we're not supposed to touch because it's unloving or unempathetic. Like we need to be reminded what is true. We need to be reminded that on these things, on the biblical things, like we are on the right side and we are not alone. And that is why we're having Share the Arrows. We are less than two weeks away, which is just Oh my gosh, I can't believe that it's finally here. Like we've been working so hard on this for you guys. I want it to be the best possible experience. I want you to come and worship with like-minded women, with Francesca Battistelli. I want you to hear from amazing teaching from people like Rosaria Butterfield, Elisa Childers, Abby Halberstadt. You are going to hear the best defenses of the faith the most igniting and rallying encouragement that you can think of. Abby is going to talk specifically to moms, but not only to moms, but she is a mom of 10. And so she's got a lot of encouragement and advice for us. We're also going to hear from Candace Cameron Bure. She's going to be on stage with me answering my questions about how to champion our faith in all different spheres, whether it's at home or in the workplace or in entertainment. And of course, yours truly is going to give a speech too. And we've got even a surprise at the end and we still have tickets. Balcony tickets are available. VIP all access tickets are available. Breakfast tickets available. Go to share the arrows dot com. It's only for women. And so get your tickets. If you're a Christian woman, you're going to love this share the arrows.com. And also, as we're talking about these very contentious conversations in this election season, I wrote the book Toxic Empathy, and it's out October 15th. And this is a guidebook for how to have conversations about the issues that I just listed. Abortion, gender, sexuality, and marriage, immigration, so-called social justice. These are the five chapters of this book, how progressives use toxic empathy to manipulate women into believing that the left-wing side of this is the compassionate side. And then I give a response uh, to that manipulation tactic with uh, the truth of God's word and also just kind of enlarging our compassion to look at both sides of the moral equation when it comes to all of those subjects. And so if you want to be fully equipped and fully prepared to have these conversations about these topics in this election season, you can pre-order the book. Go to toxicempathy.com. It's really easy to read. It's a short book, but it is jam-packed with the information and arguments that you need. So that's toxicempathy.com and share the arrows.com for our awesome event that is coming up so soon in Plano, Texas. All right. Thank you guys so much for watching. We'll be back here tomorrow.